Hello, hello. Hi, Dr. Abraham. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you doing? Fine, thank you very much. Yeah, we tried those questions out. Uh, they work pretty good. Sure, I'm sure. I'm sure you've used that kind of scenario before. Yes, yes of course. It's a good yeah, idea. Maybe next week, maybe we'll try it, you know? Yeah, when we send you the title, we'll send the question. Yeah, and if you don't like it, we just don't use it. Sure, sure. That's all. Okay, you ready to start? I am. Yeah, hold on. Let me let me uh, get my. I got a couple of other screens open here. I'm gonna get off. And we want a couple of screens together. Okay, here we go. Ten, Hello. nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami Beach. We have another in the Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds with Dr. Ibrahim Sabea. He's been doing these for 27 years, but lately on the internet. And we welcome everybody. And I'll turn it right over to Dr. Sabea. Welcome, Dr. Sabea. It's all yours. Thank you very much indeed. Oh. Hold on, Dr. Sabea, let me unpin myself here. My, my video is uh, pinned here. Hold on. Uh, okay, can everybody see Dr. Abram's screen? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Abram, you're, you're okay. Whoop, you fell off there. He'll be back. I'm ready. Okay, Dr. Abram, you're back. Okay, we'll start. Okay, uh, good day to everybody and uh, Again, this uh, uh, afternoon in Jordan, uh, we'll present a new topic. Uh, this is a picture of Wadi Ram in Jordan. Uh, this is the place where you go through before reaching to Petra, which as you know, is one of the world wonders, uh, seven world wonders. Uh, the topic for uh, this evening is gonna be colloid cysts of the third ventricle. And as usual, we'll take them from the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological correlation. Uh, colloid cysts were first reported back in 1858 by Wallman, but the first surgery was done by Dandy in 1921. Uh, this is some of the colloid cysts as they appear and as they should be excised, they should. Hello. Yes, I can hear. The screen is frozen. Uh, just, the hang, voice... just, hang, just hang on. Okay, okay. Because the voice of uh, Professor Ibrahim is cannot reach it to me. Okay. 
just Professor Mohammed Fahmi, Alexandra Egypt. <clears throat> Okay, I'm sure he's going to try to get back. I guess his connection is not so good this week. Okay, he'll come back. He'll come back. This is unusual. And we'll add the, I'm sure they're working on it. This, but this is unusual. This happens. And we'll just edit this out. It should be back shortly. <clears throat> there he is, he's back. Okay, Dr. Abraham. What, what happened, John? Did we miss the first few slides? Okay, okay, yeah. Just start where you left off. Okay, so I was just mentioning about the embryology and the development of the neural plate and crest and so on. And uh, I will take the Rathke's pouch as an example, uh, where there are two pouches, one from the primitive gut and one from the, uh, the neural tissue. They meet together, like in this picture here. It's a good example, actually. That's why I'm using this. So neuroctoderm pouch and the Rathke's pouch, which is the coming from the primitive gut, and they join together. The remnants, if they remain, they will form a cyst. And that's one of the theories about how we develop the Rathke's pouch. But we can extend this theory that this is the same theory that the colloid cysts are forming by. So people speak about what's the origin of the colloid cyst. The general consensus that this is a neuroepithelium, that is ependema, but also a strong uh, new theory that this is a non neuroepithelium that is coming from the foregut or the respiratory tract. So three lesions, they have the same origin, they have the same embryology, they have the same cyst lining and the same contents, and they arise from the primitive foregut. That is colloid cyst, Rathke cyst, and the interogenous cyst. And they all have the ciliated mucin producing cells. This is important. Uh, myself and my colleague, Dr. Hassan Farsa, the histopathologist, uh, we reported this uh, to the American Academy of Pathology, which has been published. And we stated that the colloid cyst lining consists of two distinct epithelial cell layers. First, let's layer the uh, superficial one, which is EMA positive. And the deep layer one is positive for cytokeratins. So this is the picture of the superficial and the deep layers of the lining of these cysts. And these are the goblet cells inside positive. They are cytokeratin positive, uh, cytokeratin seven, cytokeratin 19. EMA in the superficial layer is positive. The lower molecular weight cytokeratin is positive. The high molecular weight is positive. These are very important landmarks for these uh, uh, cysts, for the colloid cysts. P53 is usually negative. 63 is usually negative. And cytokeratin 20 is definitely negative. So all the cytokeratins are positive, except for the cytokeratin 20. And this is what we reported to the American Academy of Pathology. Usually the Ki67 is very low because this is a very, very uh, benign lesion. So in general, colloid cysts are rare. Uh, this is one colloid per 1 million population and they constitute 1% of all brain tumors. But look at this, they constitute 10% of all intraventricular masses. That's why we have to know about them because if you practice in neurosurgery, you'll see lots of intraventricular lesions and you have to think about it. So there's no sex predominance here. Age is 20 to 40 or more. The youngest reported in literature is a two months old infant. So where do they are located these lesions? They could be in the supratentorial like this, and these are reported cases. This is a case from Japan, uh, a recent one, 2019, a supracellular colloid cyst. 
Again, this paper confirms what I'm saying. The colloidcist, the Rathkis pouch, and the intelligenesis are of the same origin. Another supra colloidcist from India, 2014. So nothing, we have to think further. We have to think wide. Not everything in the subracellar region is a pituitary and it is not a kind of a and so on. We have always to think of a wide differential diagnosis. Uh, it could be multiple like this one, still subracellar, uh, subratentorial, but it is multiple. This is from Germany. There could be infratentorial as this, stereophosa prepontine, clinical cervical junction, and this case of mine, in the upper cervical region. And also this case of mine uh, recently, a prepontine lesion, as you can see here, uh, this, is, uh, this is the medulla, this is the pons, so this is the prepontine space, the far lateral approach, and we are removing it, and this proved to be a goblet cell positive. And this is the patient before and after surgery, and this bus up at the picture. So this is histologically confirmed, a colloid cyst. So what is the common size of all these sites that we mentioned? The common site is the third ventricle. And in the third ventricle, they love this area, the area so-called anterior superior part of the third ventricle. This is the commonest, followed by this, followed by this. Examples, and the foramen of Monroe, occupying the middle part and occupying the whole part. These are cases of mine. So we have to understand the third ventricle if we want to operate on these um, uh, patients. And this is a 3D of where is the third ventricle in relation to the other structures. So if we take the roof of the third ventricle, which is our concern, and this is the foramen of Monroe, the coronary plexus, underneath the body of the fornix, you have the two internal cerebral veins and the telocoroide and so on. So we need to know this by heart. We need to know the detailed anatomy of that part. And if we listened, if any of the listeners Listen to the lecture given by Professor Yezerji the other day. This man is 96 and he was speaking about the anatomy, the importance of the knowledge of anatomy. And I'm asking you to look into yourselves, look into your programs. Do we teach our residents the proper anatomy? I think anatomy should be the major part of our teaching and it should be the major part of our questioning. And this has been really neglected in so many, many places. So this is the corpus callosum. This is the body of the fornix. And this is where the uh, foramen of Monroe is. This is the telocoroide of the third ventricle. Hello, hello. Hello, John. Yes. Uh, I cannot hear right now. Is this uh, That's right. central? That's right. Just, just, just wait, okay? okay? Okay. His connection is not good this week. Looks okay. like he's frozen again. They, they know there's a problem. Okay. He's trying. He'll. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Abraham. You stopped again. Okay. Which slide? Did, is it this last slide or should I? Yeah, wherever you left off. Okay. Yeah, stop that. So this is the body of the, uh, the body of the fornix coming here to give the columns of the fornix. This is the anterior septal vein, anterior commissure. Anterior septal vein will join the uh, vein coming from here, the thalamus trait to form the internal cerebral vein. Now, if we take that off, you will see this junction. Here is septal vein joining the thalamus trait vein, which comes and takes uh, tributaries from the anterior, middle, and posterior caudate veins. And uh, this is important to know. Uh, the anatomy is very important here. Uh, if we look at the ventricle or the brain from above, uh, do a transfer section, you will see the ventricles. And then if we go zoom into this area, you will find here the uh, head of caudate, the body of the caudate. This is here the rostrum of the uh, corpus callosum forming the floor of the anterior wall, anterior horn of the third ventricle, of the lateral ventricle. And here, of course, is the thalamus. So there's thalamostriate vein joining the septal vein 
to form the internal cellular vein, which we don't see here. It is hidden by the body of the fornix. But this vein that you see here is the severe choroidal vein. Uh, again, one has to know the anatomy of the of the fornix. Fornix comes from two crori, two, two crosses, one cross on the right and the left coming from the fibria, which is near the uh, hippocampus, uh, hippocampus structure. And then it goes and they join together with this tenacious uh, attachment, form the body of the fornix, and then it divides into the column of the fornix here and the column of the fornix here. Just ahead of this is the anterior commissure. And if we look here at the foramen of Morro, you just go one millimeter here. This is the genome of the internal capsule. So again, it's an important anatomy, important relationship that one has to understand. I find through my career that people underestimate the colloid cyst, and its cyst has been underestimated. This is a cyst that should be respected and should be treated with a great respect. Again, the two crori of the, of, the, of the fornix joining to form the body of the fornix. And you can see the uh, choroid plexus and the choroid fissure here, the foramen of Mont, the rostrum of the corvus callosum, and so on. If you take half of the body of the fornix, then you can see the telacoroide of the third ventricle. And you can see here the septal vein joining the thalamosphere vein to form the internal cerebral vein. Like this, if you just push this uh, body of the fornix, you will see the telacoroidal. By the way, this is the uh, medial posterior choroidal artery coming from P3 of posterior cerebral. If you remove them, you can see the junction of the anterior septal vein with the thalamus triad vein. Your, your coronavirus is here, so you need to know all this anatomy. You just don't need to puncture the cyst and come out. This is a crime against humanity, and it has been done repeatedly in the past. Septal vein, thalamus triad vein, the severe choroidal vein covered by the choroid plexus. And then here you can see both forming the internal cerebral vein. Again, this is the severe choroidal vein. The telacoroide, both internal cerebral veins. And this approach has been used in the past by Dr. Apuzo to reach to the roof of the third ventricle. Now we have to understand the relationship of this colloid cyst with the, with the fornix. And that sometimes between the two leaves of the septum blossidum, you'll find the cavum septum blossidum. And sometimes you'll have lesions here that they mimic the choroid plexus. Here you can see the fornix, the column of the fornix, complete here, incomplete on this side. And if you study your X-ray, your MRI, you'll see that this colloid cyst is more on this side, on the left side. It is more attached to the the column of the fornix on the left side. Here it is more attached to the column of the fornix on the right. And if you are not careful and you cause a lesion in the fornix, as in this case here, somebody has gone in and caused a left fornix lesion, this will end with permanent memory disturbance, antegrade, retrograde amnesia. And this is important. This should be respected. Here, somebody has caused partial right and complete left, as we said. You need to know the muscular relationship. And the important ones here are the, uh, the interceptor vein, the thalamostrate vein from the internal cerebral vein joining to form the vein of Galen with the inferior sagittal sinus and with the vein of Rosenthal. Piece of anatomy that should be known by heart not just by names, you should know where they are and how to find them and what to do with them. You have to respect them. So this is the venous angle, the receptor vein, thalamus rate vein with all the tributaries, the internal cerebral vein, going to vein of gallon, joining with the inferior sagittal sinus and internal occipital vein, and this is the horizontal vein. Uh, this picture is from the book of Yazajir. I keep telling people, you cannot read the neurosurgery from handbooks. You need to know everything. You need to know anatomy. You don't just need to read something to reply an exam and pass. In this case, you will be given a certificate to kill. It is not important that you pass just like that. You, know, you need to know exactly what you are reading. You need to know exactly what, what to do with these instructions. Look at this beautiful 3D in the book of Israel. You will not find it in the notebooks and handbooks that are in the market. They are useless. 
and should be, you should, we actually should make a law that people should not read them, except in the night of the exam or just a revision. Until a septal vein, thalamostraid vein, internal cerebral vein, the other side forming here, the coming to the vein of gallon, and here the inferior sagittal sinus, and here the vein of residental, the straight sinus, and the internal occipital veins, and the others. So you can see these relations on the MRI. You can see here the, uh, the thalamus triate, the septal vein, the internal cerebral vein. So study these structures important and see that you are in a close relation with these structures. Don't underestimate the colloid cyst. It is very challenging. It is highly demanding and only the expert people should do it. Here you can see the relationship with the vessels as you can see here. So you can, by studying these, you can really know here, you can see the uh, the septal vein and the tennis cerebral vein on the MRI, and you can see them here. Uh, this paper is very interesting. It shows the relationship between the anterior septal vein and thalamus rea. Should we know this? Yes, of course you should. On the on the on this side, this is the normal side. This is presenting the foramen of Monroe. But look here, the septal vein joining the thalamus rea. Look here, it is joining it after a distance. So you should know that these are variants and you may face them. Here, it's a long distance here. It's a very far long distance. So you need to know all these variations. Neurosurgery is deep. Neurosurgery is not putting a shunt or doing disc surgery. It's much, much deeper than this. Keep telling people, especially young students and young neurosurgeons, please read from textbooks. I have not finished reading Yazarjil. These are six volumes. I have not finished them. I keep going back to them and reading from them. Every time you read them, you read something in you. Of course, you need to update the information by reading some papers here and there from all the journals. You need to know the anatomy from Rotten, for example. I'm not giving you names of textbooks. I'm telling you that you should read from textbooks. Please do not read from handbooks. This is for people who do not know, people who just want to pass the exam and are there like parrots. You ask them question, they would answer, but they have no idea what they are talking about. I have nothing against Mr. Mark Greenberg. He made his book from his uh, uh, notes uh, that he wrote just in preparation for the exams, but he read from textbooks and he just accumulated these notebooks for the night of the exam. Don't read from Greenberg as a textbook. What's the natural history of these uh, regions? Of course, they grow and they can attain a giant size, the giant colloid cyst of the third ventricle from India. Another one, giant one from Canada with hemorrhage and calcification. But look at this case of mine. So the natural history, they are the increase in size. This patient, patient of mine, 20 year old male patient, came to me 2006 with this, it was mild symptoms, I just follow him up, no hydrocephalus, nothing. And look, 12 years later, it did not change in size. They can actually resolve. This paper, 2006, resolution. Two years between this and this, it just disappeared. Here, another one, regression of these uh, one and a half years later. And this one also called, they call the disappearing colloid. Nine years, it disappeared. So the natural history that they increase in size, but also you take case by case, some cases will stop. They don't grow, some cases they will even uh, regress. How do they present these cases? They present with the main thing of hydrocephalus with all its manifestations, headache, vomiting, blood, vision. Look at this here, drop attacks and sudden death. I will come and allude to this extensively. Another presentation is memory disturbance. And the disturbing thing about memory disturbance, that this column of the fornix, they go into the mammillary bodies. They form a major part of our memory circuit. So if you damage the uh, columns of the fornix, you will, case, you will cause a major problem. I had a patient who was a pilot with this colloid cyst, and he could not even, he could not tell where he is and what he's doing. So short term memory, is, is, is very much affected in these cases. So sudden death, lots have been written about sudden death in colloid cysts. Let's see, looking at literature between this period and this period, uh, 1858 and 2018, 
All the cases presented were 107 cases. Average age, 29 years, equal male and female. And the average size is not much, it's two centimeters. So it does not mean that you have to have a large colloid cyst to have a sudden death. These are the uh, reported cases of sudden death. And these are the authors and this is the uh, journals and this is the date of publication. Uh, the mechanism here is the ball and valve theory. People say that if you have a colloid cyst and you bend forward, it is like a pendulum because it has a, uh, an attachment. It may block the foramen of Monroe and cause acute hydrocephalus. But also you can get this if you have a bleeding into the cyst. And this can come from some activity, dancing, jogging, or high blood pressure, or just sudden expansion of the cysts. And look at this, this can happen during flight, during takeoff, during landing, even days after. So we have really to look into how much we are making mistakes by allowing patients to fly when they have an intracranial lesion. So this is a very deep topic. The cardiac relation and the cardiac arrest cause is because you are pressing on the hypothalamus with all the nuclei there, which have the, vas the vascular uh, centers, and that can cause sudden release of catecholamines and cardiac arrest. Uh, can they bleed? Yes, they can. Uh, paper from Japan, hemorrhage inside the colloid cyst. Look at this, post exercise death. This is really disheartening. A man dies after exercise because he had a, a cyst that uh, had hemorrhage inside. This is a new publication in the world of neurosurgery, 2019, and this is the hemorrhage. This is a small cyst, but it cause it bled during exercise. It caused acute hydrocephalus and nobody could save him. From India, this paper, again, this is a very interesting paper. I really enjoyed reading it. It's called Flying with a Colloid Cyst. Uh, this was published in India. Uh, this is about an Indian patient who was traveling from India to the Middle East, having a job there. He complained of headache. Should I go, should I not? He wanted to go to work in the Middle East, jumped into the airplane, arrested it during the flight, and saved in the last minute. Uh, here again, that they can really attain very giant size uh, with the calcifications and hemorrhage. So what is the treatment of these uh, colloid cysts? Three lines, observation, microsurgery, or endoscopy. And whatever you do, observe or microsurgery or endoscopy, this is a challenging lesion to treat. This is really challenging. Observation is for the asymptomatic small colloid cysts that are not causing hydrocephalus, so you can uh, I follow them by serial imaging, like the case I showed you, been following for 12 years. Surgery. And surgery is the surgical procedures done for these people, either a shunt procedure or a transcortical craniotomy or transcalosal craniotomy. I will speak about shunting procedure. Shunt in the Middle East, shunt in the Arab world, shunt in the underdeveloped countries, third world countries, is a disease. The, the residents and young neurosurgeons are taught to treat everything with a shunt. And when I show you the examples, your heart will just bleed. Story of a shunt, I call it. Story of a shunt. It's a bad surgery. Look at this. Small ones. Obviously, the surgeon who has done this will give you the excuse. You would say, oh, he came as an emergency at 2 o'clock in the morning. My answer to this was, you are not kidding me, man. You can put an external drain, not a shunt. Put an external drain if this was really top emergency and then refer him to somebody who can do the surgery. Do not put a shunt in the heads of people just simply because you cannot do the surgery. So putting a shunt did not prevent this cyst to increase and cause severe short-term memory disturbance. Look at this here, shunt and this, again, it grew up and reached to the sides. To me, to put a shunt in the head of a patient with a colloid cyst is a crime against humanity. It cannot be explained except by the, the incompetency of mediocre surgeons who do not know how to treat these uh, cases. Look at this, a huge colloid cyst and they put a shunt. Emergency, life-saving, nonsense. Don't, don't kid us because we are not kidding. You cannot kid us with this argument. You can kid your residents, but you cannot kid people who are professionals. This should be stopped everywhere. 
And this is, this is another story, bilateral chance. This is really crime. Cyst is there, bilateral chance, the tumor is there. If this is, was my boy or girl, if this is, was your boy or girl, you would not put a shunt, permanent shunt to treat uh, the colloid cyst. So back to surgery, we have two routes, either transcortical through the cortex, and the place we go is between in the sulcus between the superior and middle frontal gyrus or in the middle frontal gyrus. You go like this, like this, in one of my cases. Here you go uh, interhemispheric, transcalosal, you split the corpus callosum and go into the ventricle. And again, here is one of my cases. So these are the two main approaches, but the concept is the same. For surgery, you have to have complete tumor removal. This is mandatory. And all attempts should be made to achieve this goal. Don't go for puncturing the cyst. Don't lie to your resident and say that we have decompressed this patient. Uh, this is really, this is not on. So in macular neurosurgery, complete resection is defined. And this is, you can read all papers. This is what is complete resection. It is removal of the cyst content and excession of the entire cyst wall. It is not enough to take the contents of the cyst. It is not enough to cauterize the wall of the cyst. This have, you have done no justice for your patient. And if you look at the microsurgical um, series, it's very extensive. It's been there for so many decades and they have long-term follow-up. So it is well established. Transcortical examples, as I said, either in the middle frontal gyrus or in the sulcus between both, we go with this angle like this. This is sagittal. Again, these are pictures from my cases. Here, as I said, in the sulcus between the severe and middle frontal gyrus or in the, through the middle frontal gyrus. Uh, this is the incision. This is the coronal suture here. The various flaps that you can make. The head position, this is the way you go to reach to your uh, colloid cyst. So you do cortical incision, in the, as I said, in the middle frontal gyrus or in the sulcus between the middle and the severe frontal gyrus, you go through the brain tissue here, you, you will get into the ventricle and then from the ventricle, you can see the, uh, the cyst. Uh, Aaron Cohen Gadol um, uh, invented this uh, a new technique of putting this uh, channel uh, so that you will not put retractors, you will just put this inside and then proceed with your accession. Transcalosal is to go through the corpus callosum itself. And you can see here again, these are pictures from my patients. You can see that the, the, the incision in the uh, corpus callosum, which is the major association fiber between both hemispheres should be small. One to maximum two centimeters, so that you will uh, avoid causing uh, disconnecting uh, the two hemispheres together. So this is the transcalosal principle. Again, you want to cross the midline. So this is the severe sagittal sinus. You have crossed the midline, open the dura, and then go here. You may find no bridging veins, but you may find large bridging veins. And usually you find large bridging veins. I have not seen a case without no bridging veins. Most of them, they will have large bridging veins. So you retract and then you go and then you come to the dorsal aspect of the columns callosum and you will find these two arteries, the pericallosum and above them is the callosum arterium. Uh, so here you reach to the uh, white structure of the corpus callosum. This is the pericolosal arteries. You separate them, you'll see the white structure. You do your cortical incision, which is small, one, 1.5 centimeters maximum. And then you get into the cavity of the uh, lateral ventricle, and then you will see where you are. Can you get lost? Oh, yes. Whether transcolosal or transcortical, you can get lost easily. But the landmark for you is the uh, choroid plexus. There is no choroid plexus in the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. So if you see the, the choroid plexus, follow it until you reach to the foramen of Monroe. Nothing here anterior to it. So choroid plexus is your landmark. And this is the, as I said, the column of the fornix. 
So you go through the corpus callosum, you can go right or left. But amazing enough, and most of us have seen this, that whenever you go transcallosum, most of the time you end in the left uh, lateral ventricle. So with the right or left, just the same. And then once you are there in transcalusal, you can go para for the seal. Here you go into the uh, junction here, uh, or towards. Hello. We may, yeah, we may have frozen again, Muhammad. Yeah. But yeah. just hang in there. He'll be back. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get this. Yeah. Hey, Muhammad, would you like to moderate after when he gets back? So get what? Would you like to moderate the discussion? Yes, I will discuss for you. Brent was. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll introduce you after he finishes, and then you just lead the discussion. Okay. Okay, 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 no problem. Okay, great, thank you. You're the, you're the most senior here, I think. So. Yes, I, I am old right now. <laughs> great. It's, this is like going on the fly, making it up. <laughs> you're part of the Egyptian Association, correct? Uh, I am uh, from Alexandria, Egypt, uh, and uh, I am an associate for European Neurosurgical Society. Also, I went uh, in all the days to U.S. with uh, under supervision of Professor Osama Al Mifti, but this is uh, 30 years back in 1990 oh, okay. uh, for skull for based training. Also, I wanted to. Germany on 1997 and six was Professor Majid Sami on Hanover, Germany. Okay. Also for for cerebral levantine angle training. Uh, last trip uh, for Japan, uh, spending a few months with uh, Professor Kawasi. He is a pioneer on skull based surgery. I guess. Where is professor he at? Uh, Professor Kawasi is on Keio University uh, on Tokyo. Uh, I think uh, by now he is retiring. Uh, Japanese retired from academic on uh, 65 year, I guess. Oh, That's well, right. it's, it's uh, like Finland. Okay. Finland's like that too. They, it's it's yeah, compulsory uh, re retirement. It's mandatory retirement. Yes, from academic uh, in Egypt. Oh, academic. Where, but you can yeah. just you, you can still operate, right? Yes, on private on my clinic uh, in Egypt uh, from academic also it's sixty year it is younger five years than Japan and uh, Europe I guess. Uh, in US I think uh, from academic is seventy year uh, something like this on on the USA from. Uh, uh, academic career or something. I I think it is seventy years. That I don't know. Uh, yeah, okay. Let me let me check with Dr. Sabea see if what's going uh, on here. This is unusually long. Uh, I see. And let me check with his associate here. Yeah. Uh, he usually know. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is okay. I just wrote to his associate. Okay, he says to hold on. Good, that's good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's coming back in. Okay, that's great.
We'll take you, we'll take a coffee break. <laughs> it would be longer. <laughs> this is a, this is the uh, online coffee break. Oh, I see. Doctor Muhammad, how are you? I'm Doctor Sami Khatib from Jordan. I think oh. we met many times in Alexandria with our colleagues, Doctor Mr. Okay. Abdul Aziz Bilal, uh, Abbas uh, Omar. Uh, oh, 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 hello, how are you? Doctor uh, Muhammad um, Fahmi, Zaid, from Alexandria. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And how is uh, about uh, the situation in Alexandria? I'm almost in daily contact with my colleagues there. Uh, you mean uh, Corona time and the Corona crisis? <laughs> you mean that's right? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> the Corona and everything. Uh, I think uh, on the last week, you can say in all Egypt, uh, you can say station not increase it, not decrease it. Uh, but I think we are uh, right now on the summit or the second phase of uh, Corona. I, I am speaking about Egypt, of course. Uh, we hope it will be decreasing on the next couple of weeks or so, because uh, right now we are finishing the third month for uh, uh, lockdown or partial lockdown or whatever you say, we're starting only on the last Saturday. To Excuse me, gentlemen, Dr. Sabay is back. Excuse okay, me, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. Uh, okay, uh, welcome we, back, Dr. Sabay. We'll continue. Okay, okay, okay. 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 we are with you. Okay. Okay. okay, carry on, Dr. Sabaya. I don't know what happened because we usually are uh, okay. So I don't know what the problem is from my side or your side. Anyway, we'll just continue from where we left. Uh, we are talking about microneurosurgery. And these are some of the authors that uh, uh, published, especially Johan Semeni from uh, uh, Finland and others, of course. Uh, this is a paper I cherish by Atul Gowal, my friend. Atul Gowal from India reported about 105 cases, uh, 93 had uh, surgery. He achieved total excision in 90 out of 93. He had recurrence in 11, and he had to put a shunt in 11, but he did not put a shunt up front. And this is my message. Don't put a shunt up front unless you have to. Uh, this is from Anil Nanda from the United States, microsurgical excision using the transcalosal approach in 10 cases and he supports the microneurosurgery. Uh, another paper uh, from the United States about the interhemispheric transcalosal subcoroidal approach. So, so many approaches for the uh, microsurgery. Again, this is the paper I mentioned by Jeha, Yuha, uh, if you like to call him, 134 patients, transcalosal in all patients, and he had no mortality. So surgery can be done and surgery you can excise them and most of the time rarely you will get any recurrence. Let's see endoscopy. I always keep saying that in the hands of endoscopist lies the future of neurosurgery. We are really living the era of endoscopy, but the learning curve is long. We need time, but endoscopy is a very, very useful and interesting way of doing things. And these are some of the papers published about the neuroendoscopy, uh, the number of patients, the, the follow-up, and the uh, total resection or uh, partial resection. So this is very interesting to read. Uh, this paper from Schroeder and Gap uh, from Germany uh, back in 2002, uh, using the endoscopic resection of the colloid cysts very effectively and very successfully. Uh, this paper from the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery from the US from Mark Sweden. Mark is known uh, author in this field of the uh, colloid cyst, and he uh, published this very interesting paper about the extruded content of the, of the colloid cyst. So he would show you these as examples of extruded thing and that they would not cause any problem. Uh, this paper again by Mark Sweden uh, going for endoscopic resection of incidental collapses. So the usual teaching that you need hydrocephalus to operate, uh, Mark Sudan and others say that even if you don't have uh, hydrocephalus, you can go transcalosal and remove even those incidental colloid cysts. Why should you go and remove incidental uh, colloid cysts? He published this. He showed this Dutch study and Finnish study 
and the risk of uh, sudden death from them. And he advocates that we operate on incidental uh, ones. But he also reported that cases could not be removed because uh, they were covered by the furnaces. He had recurrences after nine years, uh, recurrences here after three months with the progressive growth. So endoscopy or microsurgery, both are good tools. If you are a good microsurgeon, do it. If you are a good endoscopist, do it. This is not a fight between microsurgery and endoscopy. They can combine together and give you good, very good results. Uh, this uh, paper again by uh, endoscopy from Italy, 29 patients. Uh, this is a very interesting paper. Uh, operative neurosurgery, 2020, very recent one on the long-term outcome of endoscopic. They said, well, look, we have 74 patients. Let's see uh, what did we relieve of the cyst and what happened with the current. So they classified them into four grades, one, two, three, and four. And this is their grading. So if you remove completely, this is grade one. You leave a small remnant in grade two, bigger remnant in grade three, large, uh, uh, large uh, residual, this is grade four. And they, they look at the recurrence rate in these cases. Very interesting paper. And their conclusion was that endoscopic resection of the third ventricle without emphasizing complete capsule removal. And this is important is a good way of doing things with, with good long-term follow-ups. Uh, Mark Sweden again uh, looked at the endoscopic removal of recurrent colitis. Even if they're recurrent, he would go through endoscopy. And he uh, summarized the cases of endoscopy for recurrent colitis. Uh, very interesting paper by Michael Gap, a very famous endoscopist. Long-term results after endoscopy. Look at this conclusion, it's very important. Our results, I mean their results, indicate that endoscopic treatment of colloid cyst is a safe and effective treatment that provides excellent long-term results. But look at this. However, we determined that a significant, we determined that a significant risk for recurrence exists when even a small this capsule were left behind. So do not leave parts of the capsule because this is a major cause of recurrence. And he reported this recurrence after eight years and recurrence after 15 years. That's a gap. So uh, an endoscopy, uh, not like the uh, microneurosurgery series, endoscopy is less in numbers. They don't have long term follow ups and they cannot define what is and the, the extent of a section. There is no consensus of opinion. So let's try to see whether anybody compared microneurosurgery and endoscopy. And the question is that debate still exists between which one is better. I don't think that we should remain in that, uh, in that box, which is better. I think we should improve on both because both are good. But how can you compare microsurgery with endoscopy series? because the numbers are different, the follow-up is different, but let's try. So this is a paper by Robert Spitzler, the famous Robert Spitzler, the famous microneurosurgeon uh, in the States. Uh, Robert visited us in Jordan several times, he's retired now. And this is the colloid cysts that they show. Let's see what they said, Five, 55, 55 patients. Some of them had craniotomy, 27, some of them had endoscopy, 28 patients. And they compared the residual, the residual in one in the cranial, two in endoscopy, shunts in two, shunts here in five, and friction here five, here zero. So it appears that endoscopy is better. And he put the kaplan meier uh, curve showing that endoscopy is better. So in his conclusion, he said, compared to the transcalosive craniotomy, neuroendoscopy is safe and effective approach. Uh, finally, I would mention this again by Michael Gap uh, back in 2014. There is a need for meta analysis comparing results of microsurgery and endoscopy, where both specialties have achieved further developments. So the discussion by far did not end. Michael Gap again, in a recent paper, 2018. Again, his results say 
that there is a def definite risk of recurrence more in the endoscopy series. This is coming from one of the giants of the neuroendoscopy. Is there any other methods? So people are trying gamma knife, which to me, I don't prescribe to this thinking at all. Why should anybody think to go for gamma knife unless he has nothing else to do? And this is a paper, Surgical Neurology 2015, about you go and aspirate the cyst uh, stereotactically, and then you give the capsule a gamma knife. I mean, I don't prescribe to any way near to this kind of thinking. Treatment of colloid cyst by the same, you aspirate and then give radio surgery from USA. Again, I don't agree to this. I don't even subscribe to this. Now I'll go to my uh, series of uh, these uh, colloid cysts. I had 105 patients uh, who were operated upon, but we have lost 11 for follow-up. So we're left with 94 to report. 94 patients, uh, young patients, youngest 15 or 77. Males in my series are more than females. The main presentation, like the others, headache is more, visual symptoms, memory disturbance. Uh, investigations, we investigate them thoroughly, including a neuroophthalmic, and we do everything from endoscopy, from papilledema, optic OCT for the thickness of the optic nerve, and the color blindness and everything. And what we do also is to do Karnofsky performance scale, in addition to memory uh, testing. And uh, we found that Karnofsky in our patients, uh, we, we did not do this in all patients, we only did, did it in 32 patients. Uh, so this is the latter part of the experience. Uh, so the Karnofsky performance was rather good. The radiology of these cases and what I'm gonna show is my cases, the radiology of my cases uh, on CT, most of the time they will appear hyper dense, but they could be either. They usually don't enhance. So hyperdense and so on CT, but they could be isodense or hypodense. Do they take contrast? Rarely so, but some of them would, would take like this one. MRI, T1, hyperintense most of the time, but it could be hypo or iso. So the message here is they could be either, the three of them, hyper, hypo, or iso. They don't usually enhance, but they can take enhancement, especially peripherally on CT and on MRI. So this is a case of enhancement, peripheral enhancement. Uh, the uh, T2 is hypointense in 80% of patients, but sometimes you'd see this dot, this black dot. This is inspeciated contents. And these patients, difficult to treat them by endoscopy because it is rather hard uh, to remove. And I'll show you some of the cases. So this is the paper about the dot sign on CT, on T1, on T2, and on flare, you can see it. It's important because it means either there is calcification or hemorrhage. In other case, you will find that it is really firm, sometimes hard. Look at this case of mine, inspeciated giant uh, colloid, 45 year old male patients. On the flare, they have mixed density. And the fusion study, there is no restriction. And this is just one MRI of my cases showing you all the sequences that we mentioned. What about the size of these cysts in my series? Uh, so a good uh, chunk of them, 27 of them, they had large uh, diameter, uh, 20 to 30 millimeter or 30 to 40 millimeter. And this is different sizes of the a colloid cyst in my series. This is the largest of them, one of the largest in the world, actually. I mean, without hemorrhage, without anything, just being there. Other cases are reported where there is sudden increase in size due to hemorrhage, but this is a genuine uh, a case of no hemorrhage uh, colloid cyst. So again, in the coronal section, different sizes of these uh, cysts and the sagittal, again, the same thing. Uh, and geography, MRA, MRV are essential. You can see the bowing of the anterior uh, cerebral due to hydrocephalus, and you would see the relationship with the others. You will see the venous uh, relations that, that we mentioned. Whenever you see a lesion in that area, you have a long uh, list of differential diagnoses. Again, I'll take you through some of my cases, mostly my cases, and see what is the differential diagnosis here. Then the test. 
like like a cultist. All right, let's talk. Can anybody think of this as colloid? Think also of choroid. Arachnoid cyst. Epidermoid, dermoid cyst. Cytoma within the leaflets of the septum lucidum. Isocytoma grade two in the leaflets of the septum lucidum. One of my patients. Epidermoma four. But I think. Review these and you'll see that they look the same like colloid cysts. Astrocytoma grade three. Glioblastoma multiforme, in the same place like where you find the colloid cysts. Oligodendroglioma. Central neurocytoma. Subependymoma. In addition to giant cell astrocytomas, of course. Subependymoma giant cell astrocytomas. Choroid plexus papilloma, craniopharyngioma contained within the third ventricle. As you know, 5% of the craniopharyngioma are just located inside the third ventricle, and they have no connection whatsoever with the cell. Germinomas, yoxac tumor, sarcoma, one of my patients, peanut, primary neuroectodermal tumor, meningioma, isolated meningioma within the third ventricle, metastasis, Cavernoma, within the area where you'll find the colloid cyst. A lymphoma, forgotten disease. Aneurysm, you have to have high index of suspicion to remember that aneurysm of the basilar tip can really grow up into that area. Histocytosis X, love the base of the brain. Sarcoidosis can be anywhere in the central nervous system. Cystosarcosis. And this is a paper published by my friend, William Caldwell from Salt Lake City about this cystosarcosis back in 95. So what the approaches that I used in the 94 cases, I used mainly the transcortical, uh, 80 cases, transcalosal and 14 cases. Uh, and all patients, all of them had some degree of preoperative hydrocephalus, but I do not put a shunt. I do not, I have never put a shunt up front in the 94 patients. If it is an emergency, you put an external drain. Putting a shunt for colloid cyst, to my mind, humble mind, this is a crime against humanity and should be stopped everywhere. Do we need, did we need to put shunts post-operative? Yes, and one, we had done everything, but still we needed to put a shunt. Shunt is good, but abused in many parts of the world, including the uh, Middle East. So this is a picture where uh, one of my cases I found this is within the leaves of the uh, septum lucidum. Uh, I may use the navigation during the surgery. And I always, always end my surgery by putting external drain to safeguard against developing hydrocephalus and to wash any blood that may develop. I keep it for two, three days and until I'm, I'm sure that there's no developing hydrocephalus and no hemorrhage. Follow-up was extensive, uh, two years to 14 years, average is 7.4 years. And the treatment results, uh, we had recurrence in two, but we had no mortality, thanks God. And I'll show you and share with you this one case of recurrence, 30-year-old male patient with this seems to be inspissated, hard uh, kind of content. Uh, we removed it, this is post-op, total extension. Recurred five years later, but he was asymptomatic. So I waited on him, followed him now for nine, for three years after the first surgery. So uh, there's nothing there. It's the same size, he's remained asymptomatic. And this is some of these follow ups during his visits to my clinic. Complications we have all the complications that you can think of in this kind of surgery wound infections, he has a fistula, fever, subdural fluid collection, epilepsy. Uh, some pyramidal weakness of transtemporary. Remember that the, the genome of the internal capsule is just one meter from the foramen of model. And impaired memory in three, some of the complications, some hemorrhage in the occipital horn, some of the complications of the transcalosal, some uh, uh, venous complication, subdural hygroma, unilateral and bilateral, and subgaleal connection, collection. <coughs> Uh, some of the list of cases before we finish. 
a 27 year old male patient with this uh, cyst and this is post-operative. And this is the post-operative and another case of 31 year old female patient, pre and post. Uh, again, this 45 year old patient with this a giant one with unspecified dot that we mentioned before. And this is immediate post-op. I do the MRI the following morning. And this is follow-up nine years with no recurrence. Microneurosurgery, I think, is a very good tool and remains a very good tool. Uh, though I believe also that uh, neuroendoscopy is a very good tool. A patient, 23-year-old female patient with this uh, tumor, with this colloid cyst, and this is before and after uh, surgery. Another patient with this 22-year-old male patient with this lesion pre and post. Uh, this old man came from Yemen, 77-year-old patient. He was offered bilateral shunt. Uh, he was very sane and he decided not to take the advice. He came back to us and we did accession and he left home uh, being well. And this is seven years full up. That's before the Yemeni war occurred. The last I heard from him about three years ago. Another patient with this large, uh, with dots inside uh, cyst, causing hydrocephalus, no chance, nothing. If it is an emergency, we put an external drain. Don't, don't do these uh, shunts for people and try to explain that it was a life-saving emergency because it cannot be. Actually, putting external drain will take five minutes. Shunt will may take about 45 minutes. Uh, this patient again here uh, with the external drain that we put uh, for three days. And this is four years follow up. And this is the lady herself. This is again giant one with post-operative 36 year old male patient with large cyst and post-operative. And this is the largest of them all, a huge cyst. As I said, this is the largest cyst without hemorrhage, without any extension uh, that we have faced. And uh, this is the pictures. And this is the post-op. And this is nine years full of being well with no recurrence. Now I'll show you a few videos and we'll be finished. In fact, we should have finished in time if there was no disconnection of this uh, thing now. As you said, we also record our uh, operations in 3D, but for the sake of the presentation of this, uh, I'm going to turn it into 2D. Uh, this is in the middle frontal gyrus, cortical incision. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to choose certain cuts of the video just to show you certain principle. Here, you can see here that we are uh, coming to the uh, lining of the ventricle putting the retractors, and then you can see here that we have reached to the ependema of the ventricle. Of course, the pressure is high, there is hydrocephalus, so you widen it a little bit, reduce your retractors, and then you are up against the cyst. So I will stop this, because this is what we meant from this video, is to show you the opening of this transcortical uh, surgery. From every video, we'll give a message, Again, here, we don't need to show you the beginning. I need to go about here, show you that we are in now, and we have opened the cyst. You can see it is thick uh, contents. Here, we're sucking it. Still, it is suckable. But that's, that's not enough. It's not enough to suck the contents. You need to remove the capsule. So in addition to sucking and taking it out, then you come to the important step of the surgery, and that is to cut the capsule off the column of the fornix, off the carotid plexus, off the anterior septal vein, off the thalamus aid vein. This is the way to do it. Don't cauterize it, cut it, and remove it completely.
So this is the last piece. And you can see that we kept the fornix, the column of the fornix intact. So here you are, opening of the foramen of Monroe, saving, and at the end of the surgery, opened the septum lucidum so that there is communication between the two uh, ventricles. Okay, we'll go for the, the third one. Again here, this is the picture that you see. Sometimes they have this color, which is very much similar to the column of the phonics. So you have to be careful. Uh, coronal plexus is lying on top of it. So you have to cauterize it. But look here, the anterior septal vein here, the thalamostate vein is here. Opening the capsule, the contents are really thick and vicious. Kind of very busy, I wanted to say. So look at this crane. It's very much like the uh, Rathke's pouch assist or the uh, anterogen assist, the same principle that we mentioned. They have the same origin, ciliated doublet cells. Again, removal of the capsule. Do not cauterize. The cauterization will lead to recurrence. Simpson grade one in meningioma, don't cauterize. Remove the bone, remove the dura. And this is Simpson grade one in, in, in colloid cysts, that you have to remove them completely so that you will prevent recurrence. So this is the capsule and you have to remove it to get a very good result. This is microneurosurgery uh, and it should be done this way. So this is the last piece, okay. The fourth one. Here you can see that this uh, cyst is really very viscid, extremely viscid kind of cyst. And I'm sure the sucker is not able to take it out. It's really kind of hard, firm, and not suckable at all. Whatever you do, we're just stuck in that place. Just trying to pull it out, it's not coming out. So try all the kind of dissection, but you have to remove it. Here I'm going inside the system, trying to take this very viscid, firm kind of contents. Again, here I'm showing you different kinds of contents of this, uh, of the cyst. Okay, I think that's enough just to show you this piece of information. Here, I, uh, I mentioned that during the presentation that this was a case where the cyst was in between the leaves of the uh, septum lucidum. So it was not at the foramen of Monroe, the foramen of Monroe is here. I just let it. I went backwards and opened one of the leaflets of the septum lucidum and dissected it here of the leaflets and of the internal cerebral vein. Same principle, like you are doing a meningioma or a acoustic in neuroma. Here, uh, because we open both leaflets, you can actually work in this side of the ventricle, on the right side, and on the left side. The section of this cyst from the surrounding structures here are coming into the uh, medial posterior colloidal vessels, and here is the internal cerebral vein. So just show you that it can be actually within the leaflets of the uh, septum lucidum. So here is the vein, as you can see. Okay. Last one is, this is the last video to show, I've shown you the trans, uh, trans uh, cortical. Now we'll show you the uh, transcalosal, uh, one to 1 1.5 centimeter of uh, incision into the corpus callosum. Here, as we said, we ended on the left side. So we are on the left lateral ventricle. Septal vein is here, thalamus straight is here. So we are pulling this out. It was large, really giant one. Remember that it could be attached to the uh, 
coronary plexus on both sides. Again, contents are firm, but the technique is the same. So transcortical, transcalosal, uh, each one would give you a certain advantage. Again, here, the idea is to remove the cyst as a whole, contents and capsule. If you leave the capsule, this is a call for recurrence. And once there is recurrence, it's usually difficult to treat. Uh, with this, I would finish and I thank you for listening and I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer your comments. I hear your comments and answers. But the conclusion from this uh, uh, presentation that complete excision is really the aim and the, uh, the, the result of these uh, cases. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Sabaya. Uh, we have a guest uh, moderator here today, Dr. Mohammed Fahmy, a uh, neurosurgeon from Alexandria. I'll let him take over. Welcome, Mohammed. Hello. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Subih for his uh, panoramic uh, extra presentation uh, for the colloid test. Thank you. Uh, uh, you take a panoramic view starting from the genetic anatomy, uh, stressing the micro neurosurgery, stressing about the reading from a textbook on uh, on the micro neuroanatomy. Uh, it would be better to add here is not only reading, should be a training on cadaveric dissection. Uh, uh, it's not just to know from a textbook, but also to practice and to know the exact minute relationship. Uh, second, uh, your uh, panoramic view about a different uh, approach and the management. Uh, also, you give a short uh, to the gamma knife. I don't think is there is, is there is a way for gamma knife and uh, for colloid system to manage. I don't yeah. think so. Uh, you make a very good comparison between uh, microsurgical remover and the endoscopic. Uh, actually, uh, you mentioned uh, a few paper by Professor Gabe. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Gabe, uh, actually, I visit him in Grevenswald on uh, northeast of uh, Germany. He's a pioneer for uh, cranial endoscopy, rigid cranial endoscopy, you can say. Uh, I, I saw him sometimes, uh, not on colloid cyst, for a large intraventricular supratontorial tumor, removing it by just endoscope with navigation. Uh, uh, for me, at that time, uh, I think it is 90, uh, 97, uh, like a magic. When you, you remove a very large tumor from the lateral ventricle diameter, about 3 centimeters, by just a bare hole to, to get into, uh, to get the endoscope with the help of navigation. Yeah. For navigation, are you really need for, uh, to do surgery with the navigation, uh, microscopic or endoscopic? Uh, I understand the Professor Gab uh, used the navigation through with the endoscope, but for the open microsurgery, you can see, you can retract. Are you really need a navigation uh, in this regard? This one point. Right. Uh, uh, second point uh, about the comparison again between microscopic and endoscopic. Uh, it seems for statistical analysis, the difference is so minimal. And uh, 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 all of us know the learning curve for the endoscopy is a little bit longer than the microsurgery because all of us is accustomed to do a, a microsurgical operation. Uh, I heard uh, lately about the, not a microscope, about the exoscope. It is an, uh, a new, like a microscope, but is easier to learn. Exoscope by using a camera and the display on a large 3D screen. Uh, so, uh, I feel like there is not a big difference between the endoscope and the microscope, provided that the surgeon is well trained on both. I mean, endoscope, 
and uh, the microscope. Uh, thanks, uh, and uh, I will leave uh, the floor after this remark to the other colleague uh, and for you, of course. To Thank answer. you, Professor Fami, and I'm glad to hear your views. Uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, that I am a graduate from Alexandria University, and uh, so it gives me a great pride to say so. And I think uh, the University of Alexandria has graduated lots of brilliant neurosurgery and neurosurgeons. Uh, as far as your question is, uh, no, I don't use navigation except very, very rarely, and I just uh, use it for cases of teaching. And I keep telling my residents that your navigation is your brain and not the navigation machine. So basically, you don't need it during open surgery except for teaching purposes. Thank you for your comments and say hello to all my colleagues in Alexandria and one friend of mine who was actually uh, naive at that time when I was just started my first year in, in, in uh, medical school is Dr. Nabil Abdurrahman. I hope he's around and he's in good health. Uh, so say hello to all my colleagues in Alexandria University and thank you for sharing your views. Okay, Doc, we have a question in the chat from uh, Swatantra Mishra. She asks, what are the recurrence rate in endoscopic and microscopic excision in the larger series? Yes. It's something like three to about 10%. It's more in the endoscopic series than the microsurgical series, but the range is three to 10, uh, depending on which center you are dealing with. Okay, very good. We have another question from Natalie Gomsi. She's a neurosurgeon from Cameroon currently in the Ivory Coast. Hi, Natalie. Well, she asked, thanks doctor for the amazing presentation, please. In the mice surgical approach, what are the indications to use the transcolossal approach over the transcortical? Right, so the comparison, the question is about comparison, which way to go, transcortical or transcolossal? I personally prefer transcortical. It is less dangerous as it were, for the less complications. Some people will say there is a risk of epilepsy more in the transcortical than in transcalosal. My answer to this is that you have great risk on the anterior cerebral arteries and on the corpus callosum and the transcalosum. So which way I would go? I would study the venogram and would see how much of the veins are there and then accordingly would choose my way. If there is no, no bridging veins, I may go transcalosum. But transcortical is very good. The deciding one is the MRV, the venogram, to see the bridging veins. Very good. And there okay, is another question. Go ahead. Does someone have a question? Okay, Redab, go ahead. Yeah, Redab. You're muted there, Redab. Yeah, I hope my voice is clear. Yes. Well, um, thank you, Prof, for the good presentation. Um, it's really um, in, well, informative and organized. I will make a short question. Um, in the absence of hydrocephalus, would you still go transcortical approach? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Transcalosal is the main indication for those cases where you don't have hydrocephalus. But the question comes immediately. Why should you be doing surgery for the small says that's not causing hydrocephalus. As I said, I refer to the papers by, by uh, Sweden, Mark Sweden, uh, who likes to go even for incidental ones without hydrocephalus. I don't prescribe to this. Uh, I, uh, I, I feel that with the hydrocephalus that's there, it is easy to do the surgery. With no hydrocephalus to go transcalosal for incidental ones, uh, it's not a good idea. Okay. okay, Dr. Verlaya Cram, I believe you had a question. Can I just add, uh, Redab, oh, you're from, Redab, you're from Jordan, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm from Jordan, doctor. Um, oh, I'm and, sorry about that. And you are, you are one of the first, you are the first neurosurgeon in Jordan, am I not right? Yes, indeed, I am. Why, why, uh, John, why I know this fact? I think Redab and another two ladies are uh, about to graduate, Dr. Kanash. And my daughter, Dr. Asir. So we'll have three neurosurgeons, female neurosurgeons from Jordan. I'm proud of this because we have to empower uh, females in our countries. We have to give them the chance to proceed and they have my full support. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I already interrupt you there. Okay, more comments. Oh, Dr. Relia Cram, I believe you had a question. 
And yeah. Dr. Pote, go ahead, Dr. Alakam. Uh, hello, Professor Ibrahim Spah. Thank you for your amazing uh, lecture. Uh, I uh, have uh, a pre-operative pre question on how signal intensity on MRI or density on CT scan uh, reflect the density of, of, uh, of uh, colloid cyst. Sure, uh, sure. I have a second question on exposure. Even if we do MRV and go, uh, and going uh, transtalusa, we may face bleeding from venous lacunae. So, what's your tips about uh, about uh, uh, stopping uh, about hemostasis, achieving hemostasis? Are you using hemoclip? Are you using uh, uh, pipula? My uh, last question is: uh, uh, How often you add the trans choroidal approach? To the excision through only the foramen of Monroe to colloid cyst. Thank you, Professor. I've never used, I've never, I, don't, I don't do the transcoroidal one because I don't believe that it adds anything. As I said, the professor, uh, they used to use this uh, in the past to reach to the third ventricle, uh, but the professor, I forgot his name now, uh, to use this technique for the, uh, to reach to the, uh, the roof of the uh, third ventricle. As your questions regarding the transcalosal, yes, even if there are no bridging veins, you may have some bleeding and you have to deal with it the same way. The bleeding is the dangerous one is coming from the pericalosal and callosal margin rather than from venous sinuses, unless your retractor is on the severe sagittal sinus causing some tear there. So uh, basically, I love the transcortical much more than I love the transcalosal, but each has its own indications. Very good. Dr. Poti, go ahead, Dr. Poti, you had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Dr. Poti from uh, Great South Africa. Welcome, I just yes. To, yes. I just want to find out um, what, um, in terms of the phonics damage, because I saw your, your series on complications, you only put one, I mean, out of the 94 patients, you only had one uh, memory loss. Does it mean that you only had one phonics damage in your series? Uh, actually, no. The one I mentioned is the one who had severe uh, memory disturbance and it got worse after surgery, but then it improved again. I did not oh. have any case of memory disturbance due to phonics, uh, column of the phonics damage at all. Okay. And then in the, in the, well, that this is to, to all to all uh, uh, panelists. I just want to know: Do we know the difference between, in terms of the phonics, when you use an endoscopic approach and a microscopic approach? Because in that paper, they didn't put the phonics damage as a, I mean, as a comparison uh, criteria. So I just want to know if someone knows what the incidence of, of 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 um, how do you call it, endoscopic approach in terms of the phonics damage. Because I find that it's very like the, your space is quite narrow when you use the endoscopic um, uh, route. So I, I just want to know if no, someone knows what the incidence of the phonics damage. Yes, the answer is simple and quick: that the uh, endoscopic one has more uh, chance of uh, having uh, memory disturbances by causing uh, injury to the column of the phonics than in the microneurosurgery, but. In the hands of a mediocre surgeon, whether they are endoscopist or macroneurosurgeon, you will cause damage to the phonics. And that's why this colloid cyst should be respected and should be done by the most experienced member of the team, whether macroneurosurgeon or endoscopist. If you are not experienced enough, whether it's a large space or a small space, you will damage the column of the phonics and cause major problem. But if you look at the statistics, is more in the endoscopy than in the microsurgery. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. Okay, Rapesh Rao, now you have a question. Go ahead, Rapesh, and then yeah. you're next, Mazen. Hi, John, hello, Professor. Hey, uh, how are you going? Thank you so much for this, yet another wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a few questions as always. Uh, my first question is, is there any criteria you follow uh, to decide if you would go with uh, operation or conservative management in your patients, aside from hydrocephalus? Okay, uh, so the question is, I have a case of a colloid cyst, uh, whether I go for observation or for surgery? Uh, the answer is very simple. 
he only observed those cases where they are incidental or they are mildly symptomatic. Mildly symptomatic usually means mild headaches which are far in between. And this way I would definitely wait. And I would warn the patient about what are the signs and symptoms that he should come rushing to me if something happens. As I said, the man that I followed for 12 years, now 13 years, it did not change and he remained asymptomatic. So observation is for small, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic uh, cases. All right, and what is your protocol for your follow-up? How often do you call them for follow-up? And how often do you ask for radiological uh, investigation? Very good, very good questions. For those I observe, I follow them with three months uh, period of MRI. Three months for one year, every six months for two years, and then every year thereafter. That's if I am observing them. If I have done the surgery and excise them, and as I said, I put external drain for two or three days, and then I remove it if there is no hydrocephalus and no blood in the CSF, I follow them with after six months and after one year, and then I leave it to them whenever they uh, want to, to report to me. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. very good. Mazen, you've been patiently waiting. Waiting, no, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Great presentation, Dr. Smith, as usual. <laughs> that was one of my questions about your follow-up protocol. My other question is, what is your preoperative workup? I may have missed it. I missed the beginning of the presentation. Like in terms of CT or MRI or MRV, like what do you do? Sure. Um, definitely you need MRI, but sometimes you do CT just to make sure that uh, it is not calcified, etc. But MRI, MRA, MRV, for, for me, it's just one unit. So I always ask for MRI, MRA, MRV is very necessarily necessary. And also I ask for ophthalmological opinion to observe my patient before and after, visual fields, optical CT, etc. And we all, the, those patients, we go for Karlovsky performance scale and memory assessment before surgery and after surgery. It's very important. And you do that Karnofsky scale, so this way you have a baseline you can compare to. Karnofsky and memory, uh, memory. Okay, okay, did that uh, answer your question? Hello, Dr. Hussain? Subay. Uh, go ahead, go talk? ahead. Yeah, hello, Dr. Subay. This is me, Dr. <laughs> Muhammad Awad. Uh, brilliant talk as usual. Uh, we get used to, our, to your uh, very brilliant talks. And I have been honored of working with you one day uh, for three months period during the end of 2014. And we learned really a lot of uh, things from you. You were stimulating us to learn anatomy approaches like that. Uh, actually now um, neurosurgeon practicing in Saudi Arabia. And we have got both facilities. We have got very good microscope, Kynevo, uh, size microscope, as well as uh, endoscope, Lota endoscope. Actually, uh, uh, in this Lota endoscope, the definition of uh, the camera is high resolution HD camera. Besides, we have got the advantage of using uh, two working channels. It's unlike working with uh, only single port working channel. So uh, I operated on uh, just a few number of cases of colloid cysts. And I found uh, using two working channels at the same time with endoscope and using this rigid arm fix fixation, I found it useful in resection of this colloid cyst. Besides uh, using this angle the scope to see the, uh, if there is any remnant cyst after resection and these things. Uh, so my question, Professor, do you think this will change um, uh, the idea that uh, endoscope may have better results in the future if you work with uh, uh, two working channels instead of only one working channel? And uh, just I want uh, from your experience, what do you think? Is it, is it going to change the results for uh, gross total resection of colloid cysts? Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Awad. And uh, uh, as you said, you spent some time with us, uh, yourself and many other of your colleagues, uh, neurosurgeons, male and females from Sudan. I think there's something like 25 or 26 of you who came to us. 
I'm proud of this and I'm proud to see uh, you, the, the ones who came as residents or as fellows, uh, growing to be very uh, efficient in your surgeons. Uh, this really gave me the joy and uh, the happiness uh, to see the result of the teaching. Uh, as for your question, uh, uh, definitely there is advancement in microneurosurgery and advancement in the endoscopy. But look at this and watch my words. Endoscopy is the future of neurosurgery. I think in 20 years time, endoscopy will take over microneurosurgery. So I always advise that young neurosurgeons, males and females, go for endoscopy training. It's very important. Even if you just keep doing microneurosurgery, endoscopy would help assisted microneurosurgery endoscopy kind of thing. Any developments on the microscope, naive or otherwise, two ports of endoscopy, the rigid microscope, these, the soft micro, the endoscope, the 3D endoscope, and so on and so forth. It's an addition, and the time is coming where things would explode with this uh, new uh, new advancement, and things would improve. Whether endoscopy or the microneurosurgery is just the same. Any improvement, any advancement in those fields will give best results for our patients. Thank you for your questions, Dr. Mahmoud, and say hello to all your colleagues. <clears throat> uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, sir. Uh, it's me, Dr. Adnan. Uh, sir, nice presentation. Once again, as always, excellent presentation, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the questions you have responded, sir, uh, which I was uh, thinking to ask. But one my one of his question is that you said uh, colloid cyst can present with the uh, different uh, variation on T1. Uh, mostly, it's uh, hyper intense in T1, but it can also present with the uh, hypo intense and other variation. Sure. And the images you show, you have shown that the exact location of colloid cyst where other possibilities can be like pilocytic astrocytomas or other uh, lesions. So uh, you have, uh, in your case series, you have found any of these uh, other uh, pathologies instead of uh, colloid cyst while operating, or uh, it was the diagnosis of paraoperative or post-operative histopathological diagnosis. Right, thank you for your question. I showed you on the differential diagnosis where my cases, except maybe for one case or two cases, the one on cystosarcosis, which my friend William Caldwell reported, but all the others are my within my within my um, series. So these are the cases that I have faced, and I took them out, and they uh, came with different pathologies. My understanding and my teaching to my young residents is this: you have to have a good list of differential diagnoses for any case you come across. Don't just come across two or three diagnoses for each location. Don't think of ependymoma and medulloblastoma in the, in the fourth ventricle. Don't think of craniopharyngioma and pituitary tumors in the supracellular region, and so on and so forth. You have to be prepared, and you have to have this mental exercise, which, give, which keeps your brain vibrating when you remember all these pathologies. Otherwise, we will forget these, we'll forget these pathologies. If you don't think of pathology, it will disappear from our minds. You have to think of TB, you have to think of sarcoidosis, you have to think of that and the other. So have a long list of differential diagnoses, keep memorizing it, keep following them up, and then you will have a very good vibrating mind to know exactly what to do in each of these cases. Very good. More comments, Thanks, sir. questions? Thanks a lot, sir. Hi, Professor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Professor. I'm yeah. Wild. Thank you. Thank you. This is was uh, an elegant and high-level talk, as usual, Professor. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding the transcolosal approach. Uh, how to deal uh, with finding a bridging vein? As you said, uh, you will find it about 100 times. Uh, how to deal, how uh, can we coagulate it to, uh, or can we sacrifice it to open this uh, corridor and to increase it? As you know, this is a, a small corridor to operate. The second question, uh, when to predict that colloid cyst will bleed and enlarge from the imaging? Thanks. Uh, well, just to ask you about your first question, which vein are you talking about? Uh, the bridging uh, in the corridor of transcolosal yeah. approach, you said we will find usually a bridging vein. Uh, as you, we, uh, you teach us, 
there is usually no bridging vein between the mid frontal and the posterior frontal vein. So in case we will find it, how to deal with it, okay. uh, can we sacrifice it? Sure. Uh, again, thank you, Wael. And uh, Wael, by the way, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Wael uh, has got my surname. So people in Sudan call him Wael Usbeh, which gave me great joy. Uh, he was very uh, diligent uh, resident when he came to us. And again, like his, his uh, fellow Dr. Awad and the others, males and females, they have grown to be a very successful understanding, uh, beautiful uh, neurosurgeons. Well, what we said is that if we usually, usually you find a bridging vein. And the bridging vein for me is just like any artery. I don't sacrifice any vein. What you do is to look at the arachnoid around this vein and dissect it off. And this way you get extra length of this vein without the need to sacrifice. Sometimes you need, but don't think of sacrificing any vein unless it is absolutely necessary. Each vein has a function, each vein has a value, so don't coagulate any vein. Now, some of the veins you can get away with it and some of the veins you don't. And if I just mention a few, that the superior vitrosal vein or vein of dandy, some people say, don't touch it. Some people say, well, I've cut it and nothing happened. Uh, uh, the the saphenoparietal sinus connection with the middle superficial uh, cerebral vein, the same, you can sacrifice it or not. Uh, when you do uh, the frontal approach, you just can uh, sacrifice one of the bridging veins in the frontal area, not, not more. Otherwise, you get venous infarctions and so on and so forth. Our knowledge, of the uh, anatomy of the heart is much more than our knowledge of the venous, but they are of the same importance. Do not sacrifice anything unless it is of a great necessity. Okay, very good. Any more questions, comments from the panel? This is a very interactive session, Dr. Sabea. Thank you very much indeed. That was great. I'm sure the residents got a lot out of it. I'd like to thank you. Uh, do you have any idea on the presentation uh, next week? Next week, well, I'm going to present the foramen magnum meningiomas. Very, very good. And once again, thank you very much. And thank you for all the panel for coming. And we'll see you yeah. next week. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.